Hi guys. Happy New Year. Hello, hello. Happy New Year. Get started in a few minutes. Excellent. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Michael. Good morning, Michael. Hey, Hello. Hey, good morning, Michael. Doing Hello. great. Maybe one more minute and then we'll get rolling. Ah, white feet. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first um, Alpha Mega public meeting of 2023. Hope everybody had a great new year. And uh, get some time off, hopefully, and um, are uh, at the perfect level of caffeination to uh, have a productive <laughs> conversation. Michael, this, Michael, Michael my decided, <laughs> the world decided a long time ago not to add caffeine to the Michael over here. So, you know. It's like, <laughs> uh, so I uh, have an outline of a deck. Um, I, I like, like we usually do this, uh, we can stray far off topic pretty quickly if we would like. Um, this is really intended for all of you. So if you have questions, uh, let's just get into it. Uh, happy, first of all, Happy New Year. Um, first of all, I want to mention uh, and welcome uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Lightshoe, um, uh to the Alpha Omega team. Um, uh, Jonathan, he, he, he was just here. I guess we, I hope I didn't mispronounce his name. And, he didn't. You got it right. We've been. He just, yeah, but then he just he, he just left then. So <laughs> he's like very <laughs> glad. Exactly. <laughs> well, when he comes back, he can introduce himself. Uh, he was a uh, Dan Kaminsky uh, uh, fellowship. Um, he was on the on the Dan Kaminsky fellowship at Human uh, for the past year. He's been doing a ton of great uh, security research, and we're really excited to have him on the team, driving at scale um, solutions to hard problems. So with that, we now have a full bucket of team, and I'm really excited because this this list has grown. It's so huge, man! Like, I know. I, I I had to move things over and make people smaller and make the font just to <laughs> squeeze it, it on the page. But uh, you know, th th this is really great. So so between you know Anna from 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 City and Yesenia who joined us in uh, in November, uh, Jonathan, and then all of the wonderful staff uh, that uh we, that we we staff support that we've gotten from linux foundation from you know david and michelle and and jory who's you know uh un unable to get away from us um and and khalil and and, and uh, jay Bly, who's done an amazing job with the um you know, content marketing blog yeah, getting things actually out and done um yeah. has been awesome so um, to all of them and 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 particularly Brian for you know keeping us um keeping us moving uh and uh and 
has, has been great. So thank you to everyone associated with this project. Um, it would absolutely not be possible without every, every single one. Every single one of you. So go back, Jonathan, welcome back. Yeah, you're gonna have to forgive me the uh, the original. I don't know if anything was said to about me to me at me. I don't know. I was at the call, but uh, I realized that when I I was like, wait, it's been quiet for a while. What's up? And I joined the call. And I'm like, there's no. I see people's voices moving, but I don't see any audio. The stupid thing was the Zoom output the audio to my microphone, which has no audio output, and it of course yeah. it would. Yeah, of course it would. So yes, I, I couldn't hear anything for the first five minutes of the call, but I'm now here and uh, I'm I thrilled think, to have joined. So I, joined the, I think I think I'm excited this moment to announce a complete change in priorities for Alpha Omega. We're going to focus on the hard problem yeah. of getting the damn video conferencing systems to stop picking random devices to use as your audio just because they haven't seen it before. <laughs> Jonathan, are you, are, you, are you down for that or do you have something else you'd like to work on? Yeah, I have something else I'd like to work on, but I do have a friend at Zoom that I will go harass about this. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so I, I gave the very thinnest of introductions. So if there's anything that you would like to say about yourself, you are welcome to, but I don't want to put you on the spot, although mm -hmm. I just did. Oh, yeah, I mean, most most of y'all know me because yeah. I've been in the OpenSSF calls for a long time. But yeah, so I, you know, I'm I software security researcher, uh, uh, been a software developer, mostly focused in the Java Kotlin sort of space for a while. Did some stuff with build tools, worked for Gradle for a little bit. Um, and uh, then I got accepted as the first ever Dan Kaminsky fellow. Uh, last year, and I've been engaged in finding and fixing widespread common security vulnerabilities across open source, generating pull requests, tens, hundreds, and sometimes thousands of pull requests to fix various different security vulnerabilities across open source. And um, I was looking for a natural next fit for the um, the work after the Dan Kaminsky Fellowship to kind of say, hey, I've been working on this project, but where, do, where, like, where can I continue it? And the Alpha Omega project seemed like the perfect landing place for for my work and 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 also forwarding the mission of Alpha Omega. So um, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm looking forward to working with everybody to uh, to progress that mission of securing you know critical projects and also the long tail of open source projects all over the world. So yeah, awesome, uh, great, very much welcome. We will live with our microphone problems for a little longer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I'll do this slide because you did all the hard work. Um, so uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at our annual report, please do so. It's up on the website. Uh, you can ping us, we'll send you links if you really can't find it. Um, it's actually been a pretty exciting year over the course of the year. Like we went from just starting out and figuring out what to do with money to like actually meaningfully making a difference, seeing a steady stream of reports coming back from various people. And that played out really well. Amazon was sufficiently uh, interested in the work that we're doing that they've announced funding for us, uh, which really is just great to bring them to the, uh, to the organization and to have their support. Um, still have a lot of things we need to figure out. We're always listening and always learning. I think our, our sort of spirit of experimentation and learning from sort of iteration will continue to go on. Um, but really just a, a tremendous year. Uh, I would try and do some highlights, but honestly, just read the report. I think that's what we really want you to do. And, and if you'd like to see things in the report that you don't see, tell us about that too. So we also have the the whole, and, and this really isn't us, this is OpenSSF as a whole, but uh, just calling attention to it, this was published uh, last week. So take a look at this as well. This is, I think, the second item in the on the OpenSSF slash blog. Um, this, this, you know, is, is the, the larger view inclusive of, of Alpha Omega, but all the, the working groups and the SIGs and the projects and everything else. Uh, and I think it, it tells a uh, it tells a good story for for the impact that OpenSSF has had in 2022. Um, so I just encourage you all to look at that if you haven't already. So we, we've had the um, you know the alpha engagements that started in 2022. Most of those you know continue into 20. I think the well, but they all continue into 2023. Um, and we're we're in active discussions with some of them about. You know, renewing and what and what the future is, and potentially other um, alpha engagements. Um, all of the updates are have either started to or will be going to that uh, to our GitHub repo at that link. So if you're ever interested in like, hey, what is you know uh, what has Eclipse done recently? You know, around this, like 
th there'll be a you know page in it some markdown files and things like that so we're, we're going to use that um and that was always our intention to to use that to collect um kind of monthly just updates um Uh, on the tooling side, um, we've made uh, so with with Yesenia having you know joined us, we've been able to make a lot more uh, a lot more faster, better progress. Uh, so uh, I'm excited here. The, the analyzer is uh, steadily improving. We've been doing some refactoring, just bumping tool versions, uh, but getting in, in a more usable state for um, for more people. Uh, assurance assertions. I talked about this last month. Uh, the, the, there's a link, um, well, there's a link in the deck, but that probably doesn't help anybody. I will post a link in, in chat when I stop talking, um, to the, to the deck. Um, th th this is the idea that, you know, we, we, we run some tools or we do some activity and we assert that that activity or that tool run has been done. And these were the aggregated or interesting results of that. And then you as a consumer can base a policy on those assertions. So you can say, um, I, 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 I want to know if any of the open source projects that I use have uh, this type of vulnerability class found by CodeQL in, an, in a fully automated way. So there's no, there's no triage necessary for that. Um, so it's, it, it's, a, it's an experiment. You shouldn't rely on it. Please don't base your business off of it or you know things like that. Uh, but feedback is very most most welcome if you're interested in getting um, you know getting involved. Uh, we are talking with uh, Guac um, later this month, and uh, we haven't set it up, but scorecards as well uh, to figure out like what are the right places to integrate this, and you know how, how does this need to iterate in order to become something real and useful and stuff. And we're we're keen to pull this into with scorecard, have that shot showing up in the devs.dev results as well. So it becomes easier to discover and find and manage as a team. So yeah. And there's more exciting stuff coming from there too on the Google side. Yep. Um we last year we started putting together a triage portal. We kind of put hit pause on that just for priorities and time. Um, it looks like we're going we're gonna to move that forward a little bit more. Um, this is intended to be a place where security researchers can go to um, essentially upload tooling results and then see things vertic you know, vertically for a particular project across multiple tools or for the same tool or class of vulnerability or whatever across all projects. Um, Right now, it's intended for like single user, local kind of work. Um, we'll see where it goes from there, but. Uh, well, I think, I mean, it's yeah. worth talking about, like, you know, a, a vision that we're starting to, to hold more dearly is this tool chain ultimately should become part of people's, you know, any projects release process. At some level, you should be able to say, okay, we're gonna go off and run a bunch of stuff and see what it can find. And then, make assessments, make, you know, do triage. Not, every, not everything it finds is a real problem, whatever like that, but like, you wanna be in a position where no surprises. The last thing anybody wants is for somebody else to be able to find things in your code that you didn't know about. And so I think that making the tool chain and the use of it, you know, not be a security researcher only kind of experience, but something that people can apply, you know, not quite script kitty level, but definitely, you know, a little bit more uh, easily integrated into someone's existing pipelines. It's yeah. a very interesting opportunity to allow us scale what we're trying to do within Omega. So, yep. Cool. Um, so, if y'all want to help, um, if if you're security researcher inclined, um, you know, certainly using our tools and telling us why they're, you know, if, if they are terrible, please tell us that they are terrible and why and, and help us improve them. Um, if, if you have specific improvements, just open issues with pull requests are great. Um, you know, that's that's all good. And, and we, we now have cycles to like action them faster. So hopefully we'll continue to make fast progress on those. Um, if you're a dev, we have marked some of the issues kind of good first issue or help wanted. We'll continue to do that. Um, you know, those are particularly ones that we think are self-contained enough that you don't need a, a lot of um, integration and backstory to, to drive that. Um, 
but if there's something else, like let's let's have this conversation. I think that's the last slide. Yeah. So um, if 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 there's something that you would like to see us see us do or partner with us or whatever, like let's let's have that conversation. Um, those are all the words I have. Um, what do you guys think? I think when you reach the big right white slide, you should stop presenting so we can. Mm. I always forget to do that. So. Stunned silence from the studio audience. You know how it goes. I start asking people questions just by the names I see and the, you know, the activity on the screen. I'll start asking people to ask questions. So, or I drop the call with some lame excuse because I've got another meeting or something. <laughs> All right, Jonathan, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to assume that people know of you, but maybe don't know exactly what you've been doing. Uh, and I think it'd be very interesting to hear you talk about sort of the scale PR approach that you've been doing to find classes of vulnerabilities and then push the fixes out as well. Um, feel free to just chat and talk about it, and hopefully that'll provoke interesting questions and conversations. Yes. Um, so I have been over the past couple of years. Um, been kind of fixated on this idea of automating fixing security vulnerabilities at scale. And I've given a talk about this at Black Hat, DEF CON, um, and then a spread of a bunch of other conferences. The best version ended up being given, I thought, in Italy because the audience, I don't know, the audience was great there. Um, but if you, if you want to find that talk, it's uh, titled Scaling the Security Researcher to Eliminate Open Source Security Vulnerabilities Once and for All. And you can find it on YouTube in a bunch of places. Um, and at a high level, it was about basically using um, tooling. Um, in particular, I leverage a bit of tooling called Open Rewrite, which is a format preserving abstract syntax tree transformer um, that let us uh, generate automated fixes for vulnerabilities in a way that modified the source code at the AST level, but did so in a way that preserved the surrounding formatting so that the pull request didn't, you know, the big problem that you're dealing with is like you're trying to generate an automated pull request and you're going to not make it look like the, the surrounding source code, right? You want to, you want to generate a pull request that looks like the surrounding source code. Um, otherwise, the maintainer is not going to merge it. So you have to use tabs or spaces or you know, whatever their weird formatting style is to generate the new code and open rewrite offered the unlock of trying to figure out what the formatting was around the source code and then giving you the ability to generate new code that looked like this, that surrounding code. Um, and so I leveraged it as well as adding features like data flow and control flow analysis to open rewrite to allow me to look at the code and the surrounding code and say there is a vulnerability here because I can see the data flow that's local to the procedure and or I can use control flow to say there's not a guard in place to like for zip slip right there's not an, an adequate guard to protect against uh zip slip which is a zip slip is a vulnerability that's a path traversal vulnerability while unpacking zip archive files um, and so you can say, okay, this is not fixed. We need to inject a guard there. Okay, now the guard's injected. Is it sufficient? Yes, it is. Okay, now we can generate the pull request. Um, and uh, so, you know, that that's the kind of work that I've been doing over the past couple of years. Um, I've done simpler things. One of the bigger projects that I engaged in, one of the first projects that I ever engaged in um, prior to, you know, even calling myself a security researcher was I did some research around HTTP downloader dependencies across the Java ecosystem and um, uh, found that a wide swath of the Java ecosystem and Java open source projects were still using HTTP to resolve their dependencies instead of HTTPS in their Maven and Gradle builds um, and uh, reported it to a bunch of different organizations um, and then uh, worked with Maven Sonatype and JFrog and Gradle and a bunch of other organizations to decommission support for HTTP in favor of supporting HTTPS only to resolve dependencies across the Java ecosystem. Um, and so that initiative broke a bunch of builds. Um, on January 15th, 2020, we stopped, we dropped support for HTTP across the Java ecosystem in favor of HTTPS only. 
um, which broke a lot of builds, but it's it fixed a gaping hole in the supply chain of the entire Java ecosystem. Um, and so I have kind of always, you know, looked at these problems and been like, okay, where can we fix it from the root cause? Like what, where, you know, how far up the tree can we fix it? Can we fix it at the root cause? Can we fix it at the supplier? You know, if not, okay, well, maybe it's bigger than that. Let's, let's figure out where we can fix it at like, you know, the organization. So I also on top of that generated 1,596 pull requests to fix the vulnerability across the Java ecosystem as well. Um, that was just a simple HTTP to HTTPS replacement sort of thing, right? Um, but those, you know, those sorts of projects of like, okay, this is everywhere. Let's go clean it up. Let's not just report it to the top five projects, but let's go and like tackle it across the entire ecosystem. Those are the kind of projects that I have been fascinated by, interested in. Um, the line that I always tell people is I'm not necessarily really good at going deep, although I have gone deep on vulnerabilities at times, but I'm really good at going wide. I'm really good at like, where is this vulnerability? How often does it occur? Oh, that's really interesting. Ah, oh, damn it. Now I have to do something about it. Um, and so, yeah, because I, I kind of, when I, when I find things at scale, I kind of feel like I have an obligation to deal with them at scale. So, you know, it's like, all right, I've become aware of it. All right, now I got to do something about it. Well, oh, well. <laughs> so that's, that's a little bit about me. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, having the opportunity to continue to move forward on these projects with the openness SIF and, you know, the Alpha Omega project. So, uh that's my resume in a condensed nutshell um i'm also very passionate about supply chains i've worked for gradle prior to this and did you know i worked i, I did supply chain stuff and um uh yeah so anybody is ha you know feel free to ping me ask me questions or, or you know if you want to know more or you know yeah that's is i don't know is that what you're looking for michael it was perfect thank you great so I have a question uh, to this general community as in, uh, so as Jonathan was looking at, uh, and he was mentioning about this problem that uh, like he's looking at the problems where things can be scaled. So uh, looking at small changes in the code that can be made ubiquitously. Uh, on the other hand, there's the more serious, like in, it, it doesn't work when you're talking about, let's say a SQL injection or a cross-site scripting, like those kind of scenarios where uh, you can make a, the same change across the board and, and it would still work. So it's just like a thought question of how often do we see that side, uh, like where there's a single fix that can be spread far and wide versus uh, the effort is asymmetric, as in you have to really prepare a fix for a particular instance and that takes time mm -hmm. and that's really hard to scale. So that's, that's yeah. also part of the problem, yes. Yeah, so I mean, I've thought a lot about this sort of problem and and like one of the so zip slip, right? Like it was a great candidate for my research because usually the the location of the vulnerability is located to a single procedure call. And uh, you know, even at at best, the fix for that and using automation um is a security vulnerability fix, and at worst is a security hardening. So you're not inducing, you know, potential additional, you're not breaking the code, right? With SQL injection, you actually don't necessarily have those characteristics because you can um, potentially generate code. Like if you wanted to automate fix, I, I think that it's possible to fix SQL injection through automation. Um, I think that we could generate the code to do that, especially with things like data flow and control flow analysis. Well, um, we do that. We do that. But the point is it doesn't, so in, in practice, it, it works for, let's say, 20%, 25% of the cases, 75% of the cases is manual because code is complex. Uh, and 25% and is better than 0%. I, I yes. get that. But, but uh, I mean, people have done that. Our, like our tool, for example, can do that. But I mean, there's been academic research uh, for on this specific thing, like SQL injection was just an example, but on this specific thing, this can do. But in general, the question is that uh, it's like majority of the hard vulnerabilities, the effort is asymmetric and it's one-to-one. -one. So <clears throat> are there any ideas of, uh, of like, how do we, and we're talking about like having a portal where uh, like a triaging portal and, and so on. So uh, part of the difficulty that I have faced before or we have faced before is, 
when we uh, when we try to submit a pull request without an actual fix, then it largely gets ignored and and so on. So how are there any ideas of like how can we use this portal to also like produce fixes for problems on behalf of the maintainers so that those can be I, I think the the main problem is that uh, that the maintainers, the open source project maintainers, they are not updating their code soon enough. Uh, security hardening or security vulnerability fix, and however you look at it, they're not updating their code. So because they are just busy. So how can we reduce that that workload uh, from from that side? Any ideas on it, on that? I think the most interesting, like the, there are so many like rabbit hole, not, not rabbit hole, but I guess kind of rabbit holes here where the, the like. The, so, so if if you think of a graph of like the difficulty of a fix, like some or, or the the complexity of a fix or the complexity of the of the you know had had a reason from vulnerability to solution, um, and and let's just say it's kind of a some sort of a hyperbolic thing. Um, so you have lo lots of kind of low hanging fruit there, and then you have the impact of the vul vulnerability, and that's kind of probably the other way where a very small number of vulnerabilities have a very very high impact, and there's a long tail of lower impact ones. And if you like mush these two together, you probably get something that's like, you could sort it differently, but you have high, and maybe it's not, maybe, maybe I'm thinking like like a like a thing here where you have a, a quadrant of high impact, but relatively self-contained. So, so zip slip, I think is a good example of, you know, catastrophic if you are affected and relatively easy to detect. Um, something like, you know, um, and, and uh, like anything with with authorization, like I think is is really hard. Um, certainly, parsers can be really hard. Um, and I would I would say that the, the strategy that we I, I think would make sense is let's make all of the, let's make the high impact, easy to detect stuff go away, so that we can stop uh, eventually like stop worrying about those, and at the same time do the research now so that in five to 10 years, we have better tooling to like start in on the, the juicier stuff. Um, I don't think it makes sense for Jonathan or anybody else to take three months to do, like, like if you take like, like Spectre, um, Spectre Meltdown, all that stuff, like that super interesting research. Is that the kind of thing that we would have spent, you know, six months um, researching into? Well, I mean, Probably not, but like the impact was huge. So um, I, I think things like that belong more in academia or dedicated like research institution kind of thing. I mean, yeah. So like, there's a, there's a lot of like my my mindset is there's a lot of low hanging fruit that researchers have kind of found and left lying around in blog posts and stuff like that, and they've like maybe reported it to like half dozen projects, but never reported to all the projects. And like this is the kind of thing that's like, hey, like you know. I got I got described as like the the janitor of the open source community, right? You're kind of sweeping up after this the main after the researchers that have kind of like worked on a project and then dropped it before it's been like you know handled all the way through. Um, and that's not it's not glorious. It doesn't sound glorious, but I find those sorts of projects to be fun. Like you know, let's see how we can actually fix these things at scale. So I do agree that you need to go deep in places and I would love to learn how to go deep in more places because that's a skill that I actually need to improve um, because being able to go deep on certain things may give me wider angles on more common security vulnerabilities. But um, uh, on top of that, like, let's just, let's, let's go, let's, let's go, like, let's maximize the amount of time that we can spend to fix the most number of vulnerabilities possible um, at scale and hopefully also get some of those harder to get projects that we can't automate too sometimes. Um, but in general, let's, let's focus on the, the meat of the, the big problem. And, you know, yeah. Dan, uh, David, you've got a hand up. Yeah. If I, I, if I can jump in, I'm going to try to uh, take another crack at uh, answering Lenora's questions and feel free, if, if, feel free to disagree. Um, you asked earlier, you know, how do we encourage you know, people to update, um, you know, particular vulnerable components to a version that isn't vulnerable. At least that was part of the question as I understood it. Uh, there's there's actually already quite a bit of work to uh, encourage this direction. Um, 
you know, for individual open source projects, the obvious simple way is to enable one of the many, many tools available to warn you when, hey, wait a minute, one of the components you're depending on has a known vulnerability, please update. Uh, GitHub has such tools built in, GitLab does. There's a lot of, of third party tools that really dig in that can do that. Um, the, one of the problems, of course, is not all projects use these tools, um, even though they, thankfully they've gotten easier to integrate. Um, and really, I would argue that this is the uh, rationale for the big pressure from U.S. government. Some other governments are, are looking at this as well uh, for S-bombs, basically saying, hey, when you give me a product, tell me what's in there so I can do my own analysis because this is a problem. And I think the theory is now anybody who says, oh, hey, S-bombs, don't worry, we'll get it all deployed next month. I mean, that's I, I think that's insane. Um, you know, in, in the industry didn't generate S bombs before, so this is a long, this is a large, long term task. But that's okay, um, as long as we acknowledge that. But I, I think that will create pressure backwards to encourage projects to uh, to add those checks, and for you know, and some people are saying, well, hey man, you know, where's you know, where are people getting paid to do this? Well, this provides organizations incentives to pay projects to add those tools to detect those dependency problems. Now, here's the challenge. That assumes that there's a component with a known vulnerability and ideally with the known updated version with the fix. Um, and this is one of the areas where Jonathan basically has a lot of experience where if all you had to do is update a dependency, that's relatively easy. But if in fact it's a pattern of code that is repeated over and over and over again because somebody copied it from Stack Overflow or somewhere else, or it's just kind of the obvious way to do it, uh, you know, say, or it's copied from the documentation, um, you know, what Jonathan's been able to do is, is find ways to scale up across a very large number of places where it's not just update the dependency, it's actually within the code itself. And unfortunately, there's a lot of those and almost nobody's been covering this ground. So it made sense to, to uh, work on this because it's not an area where, say, asking about S-bombs or, or inserting dependency analysis necessarily helps you out. Yeah, uh, I mean, feel free to- I'm very, I'm very familiar about Jonathan's work and, and, what is, and, and the value of that. Uh, what I'm trying to uh, suggest is like there, there's, I mean, as, as much as we work on this one, there's also the hard problem and how do we do that? So one of the things that I was thinking of, and that that's basically, I was kind of uh, creating a uh, pretext to, to bring an idea, which is uh, working with the academia. Uh, and, uh, and like there, there are these security courses that are being introduced in the academia and they look for uh, like real world exposure. So if we have tools that, have detected vulnerabilities. Uh, and what we need is a fix that we can then pass to the maintainer so that the fix can be accepted, triage and accepted quickly, but it's, an, it's a hard fix to create. So it would require some manual effort in order to do that. And that can be done in a crowdsourcing way. And, and so we can work with, uh, let's say 10 institutions uh, doing their security course. We can give them their homeworks or homeworks for their students. Uh, and there's tons of these homeworks that we can create because there's tons of bugs that we can detect. And then they would be done there. And then this information is gonna be passed as a conduit uh, through to the security community. I mean, th that's that's one of the things that I've been like, that's my New Year thing. Uh, <clears throat> people think of Happy New Year, I was thinking of that. But, but anyway, so th that's the idea that I wanted to bring in uh, as in how do we, because that's an asymmetric, it's a hard problem. Can we do a crowdsourcing model to try to do that? Now there are risks in, involved because when we expose these, uh, these information, then, uh, then it will be also you know, like open for attackers or somebody else to subvert it. But it looks like we are looking towards having a portal of some sort anyway, where the information would be public. So in that case, it's actually become more riskier because when the information is out, at that point, fixing the problems or the detected problems as soon as possible is the key. So how can we leverage upon crowdsourcing? So, so can we do that? Is that? Yeah. So, so just clarify, the portal will not be public. 
um, it, it will be authenticated at, at at worst or private at like on the other end of it, but it'll never be like public public. But uh, for for the university thing, just connect up with Yesenia and and Anna uh, who are running a project to frankly starting a project to do effectively that, uh, or at least very very close to that. So um, I encourage, encourage you to just join up with that effort and and um, like. Yes, uh, let's make it happen. I, I, I want to be careful, like not, not to, I'm especially optically, I don't want to try to you know, like use free student labor as like, you know, the janitors of well, the- Well, community. as an outsourcing model, there can be a payment back. I mean, we can pay back for the- can, Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, and can be gamified and, and so on. I mean, one of the things- students get something good out of it, I'm comfortable with it, um, but I wouldn't, you know, I would just, we just need to be careful about uh, how, how that, I, I, I should observe that I'm actually in, in my copious free time and actually an adjunct professor uh, at uh, George Mason University. Um, so I am familiar with now there are some interesting challenges you've already mentioned one how do you keep information uh, private. Uh, another interesting challenge which uh, you may not uh, you know uh, depends on where they are in their in their uh, studies. Uh, but if it's part of a class now you have to figure out how to grade it which uh, is a little interesting and uh, professors don't scale very well, it turns out. So um, <clears throat> uh, so if it's part of a, of a larger granted research project, then a whole lot more becomes available, uh, but uh, you still have some complications there. Um, there are some weird things that are different about incentives. I mean, the fundamental issue here is that for academics, what matters is publishing papers. Fixing problems is not on the radar. Publishing papers is on the radar. Yep. I Michael, you, I don't know if you're going to agree with me or disagree with me. Uh, I, I, I totally agree. But 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 but, but the difference is that uh, grad students, um, uh, uh, professor track grad students, uh, and professors themselves care about publishing papers. Undergrads don't care about publishing papers. I, I, right. I've never met one that did. So, and, and there, are teaching, there are teaching schools too. There are teaching schools too. I mean, there's okay. like professors who are not in. I mean, I've been in the okay. academia, so I, I know all, all the. Fun. Like, I was solely devoted to publishing papers and and grants. I mean, the fixing problems. Yeah, not not my <laughs> not my thing. But uh, but uh, but then uh, there's like uh, I I know very many colleagues who are in like teaching schools. Uh, where where this is an important skill that they want to impart into the student, and that's a noble goal altogether. So we probably will not be, let, let's say, collaborating with Stanford, but let's say San Jose State University. Yeah. I mean, that's a fair game. I I, I think at, at minimum, if you look at like an undergrad or or even a grad level uh, sec, cybersecurity education, I would posit. I, I guess that. Um, the amount of applied stuff in there is relatively small. I could be completely wrong here, so tell me if I'm wrong, but like as th this kind of work is super applied and real world and like there's there's the the this external thing that I made better as a result of this. If I were in school, like I mean I I feel like that would be a lot more a lot more compelling than you know a theoretical like network security course where like you know I don't know. Um, yeah, so I, I I would guess I would go further on. I mean, as I said, I'm, I'm actually in that that area as well. I would encourage thinking through how can we square the various incentives, because in fact I have overseen students who found vulnerabilities and you know, develop fixes and work with upstreams. Um, so it can be done. I have also found it very challenging to do. Um, either their goal is to get, you know, papers published, in which case that's not real, fixing is not really the goal, or the goal is to get, you know, get a grade in the class, in which case, you know, the, the goal is very much, you know, the teacher has to, you know, the professor has to oversee and find a way to grade this uh, to make sure that the work was actually good enough and how do I, I grade. Yeah, the, while, while these aren't insurmountable, I will say that I personally have, oh, I've had some success doing it, but it's actually been rather challenging uh, to do just because the incentives are not really uh, connected. So if anyone has, if you or others have ideas about how to 
uh, improve the connection so that it's wins for everybody. I think that would be uh, fantastic. We have had, we've, we've had some challenges doing it, even though we have had some successes. Uh, more connections with more people who have found a way to square this circle better would be fantastic. Hi. Bug bounty programs are a pretty effective way. I mean, like, you know, I, so one of the things that I've, you know, I, I uh, thought about, you know, is, um, so GitHub, GitHub has the GitHub Security Lab for writing code kill queries to pay people to write queries that identify new vulnerabilities. Um, there is, you know, a good, it it's they're they're not easy to write but recipes for um open rewrite is one like one of the things that i've i've discussed with jonathan schneider who is the ceo of open rewrite is this idea of let's encourage people to write open rewrite recipes to fix security vulnerabilities and pay them for those in order to get those into a corpus of campaigns that can be continuously running against new code as it's identified right um so continuously like I, my like all of the pull requests that i've generated have been one-offs but that doesn't like as soon as a new vulnerability is identified or created in, in an open source project it doesn't fix it right it's it's only whenever i run the thing so my long-term plan has always been to set this thing up as a as a cron job that runs on a like weekly or every two week basis and just generates new pull requests right um we could use like that 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 labor that we're you know paying via bug bounty to create a series of 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 recipes that are targeting open source security vulnerabilities and uh have a very low false positive rate and you know actually getting those things deployed at scale and continuously running against open source is is um michael put you on the spot is sos.dev a reasonable like I mean, in the, in the current, I know we, we haven't talked too much about it recently, but like the the idea of screw open source rewards is that I can get paid for making a security fix for David's project. Yep. Um, I think that, you know, I, we've talked about this, right? It's the, you know, it's very much an artisanal process right now uh, in every sense of the word, right? The people who are coming in for rewards are individuals looking for some stuff to do and getting paid for it. And the projects that are typically getting helped are relatively small projects without the resources to do the things themselves. And the process for which we decide and approve things like that is a little bit sort of hand handcrafted now. Scaling that in some way is super interesting, right? Like how can we actually start to get crowdsourcing of fixing? I, I'm I'm cautious about this, right? It, like. It, it, Anytime somebody says, oh, we're going to solve this problem by crowdsourcing it, I'm like, you just decided you don't have enough money to pay for something. And now you're depending upon a bunch of like volunteers, right? And is the SOS money going to come? Like, it's, it's going to be hard for somebody to make a job around being an SOS fixer, right? And so some of the other initiatives that you and, and Microsoft and Google are both doing around open source maintenance efforts, Amazon as well, right, are recognizing that, you know, this stuff doesn't pay for itself. It has to be done. Um, so. I would love for us to see ways for SOS to start be sort of tapped into getting things done on those that very long tail of smaller project, right? You That's. It, I just think maybe what we need actually, like I would love to see like a page that has like a, uh, I don't know, some sort of a architecture time like thing where you say, you know, how can you like what are the incentives around participation in the open source security community and like there's like bug bounty stuff for certain projects and sos.dev for other ones and full-time employment for others and like these other things where how do you get a map. how do how do i live a life while doing open source yeah work? yeah because i mean that i've had that problem right that's that was why yeah. i chose to join the dan kaminsky fellow or i applied to the dan kaminsky fellowship because i'm like i'm working for gradle but i have this idea i can't fund it like I thought about, you know, I thought about how to do code QL queries and you'd need to do like, in order to make a hundred thousand dollars a year, you'd need to have, you know, you need to have 10 critical security vulnerabilities where you both for, find four cases of the CVE and also write the code QL query per year. And like, that's a lot of work. That's, you know, it's, 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 that's, you know, 
Um, and my cadence is slower than that because I, you know, dig in and really try to make sure that I understand the vulnerability and get it fixed fully and also try to like report it to a bunch of projects. And so the Dan Kaminsky Fellowship was a really good candidate for, they paid me a salary for a year, which is, you know, and now I'm able to do this. So that's, that's a problem that I've actually tried to figure out how to face and, um, and, and uh, if you're not, you, you kind of have to do it as a side gig until you figured it out. It's, you know, and so, but offering the money, the bug bounty, you know, bug bounty payments uh, for that sort of work, that's, it, it's a good start for people to, to are trying to figure out how to, how to navigate that stuff. I also want to bring to attention the internet bug bounty program that also exists. I don't know who that's, I think that's a, I don't know who's running that currently and who's associated with that, but that's another one that um, uh, is trying to also encourage this sort of work or at least pay for that kind of work post, post it being done. Randall? Um, yeah, um, over the Christmas holidays, there was some talk about um, I get because SKF is involved with a lot of people and some of the people that are involved with SKF were interested in seeing SKF introduce a bug bounty platform. Um, and there's a significant amount of money available if we wanted to go that direction. So and, uh, do you mean, would that be a competitor to, you know, Packer One Bug Crowd? Not really, because of, like a lot of the people that are involved want to see it more for the open source community. So they don't want it like it wouldn't really be kind of commercial based projects. It would be things like GNOME and things like ADE and things like that. I, well, Hacker One will happily take um, open source projects. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I know that there are a number who are served serve that way. Yeah. I, I think doesn't LFX have oh no they're that's sponsors um yeah no i i i i'm i'm usually in favor of like let's have more options um i did want to throw a quick plug in um just because it was mentioned earlier we do have a doodle poll for the the meeting on the education di uh working group I posted on the channel. Uh, it looks like next Tuesday, the 10th. Um, and then if you want to get up to date on the information, I also added the Slack channel. We'll kind of be talking about uh, running these kind of bug programs through the uh, underrepresented groups, uh, organizations, and universities. Awesome. Um, there, there was something that I, I wanted to follow up with, with before, which is, um, like, yes, it's great for us or a, a cron job or people or whatever to be like looking at, at, like scanning a whole bunch of stuff and finding things and getting them reported. Obviously, I think we all, I think we're all in agreement that it would be even better if the maintainers found this themselves as part of, part of normal PRs and fixed it. And like, we never, it, it just never existed uh, in, in, the, in the first place. And I think that there is a, place not for alpha omega because I don't I don't think it's an alpha omega thing but definitely open SSF in trying to push on answering questions like why don't more maintainers use you know pick a code scanning tool and fix things when they're found uh why is the um why are so many like depend about alerts as an example um you know to either never actioned or did it take so long to action um is there you know, and maybe these are hard problems where like the incentives, like it's just not actually that important to the people that are doing the work because that's not like their their needs are not your needs. And like, um, but but whatever it is, like if we can, if, if more of that work can happen upstream, then it kind of, it never becomes low hanging fruit because it never gets in the first place. The other place to do it though is in the platforms themselves. And I mean, platform like, so uh, as an example, I know the, um, Munavar, the um, request, you, you open up HTTP request without a timeout, like, yeah, you could hang forever. Why would the default of that not be something sane and sensible? And is there a way to work backwards and kind of retrofit in sensible defaults? Or like, you just can't concatenate strings into a SQL query anymore. Like, let's just 
you just can't do that anymore. Um, like, and, and, and those are years long efforts. Uh, but I think to actually turn the faucet off at the, at the house, um, like I, I would love to see more effort, you know, focused there. Randall, you're going you're gonna to tell me that's impossible to go away. No, I'll, I'll, I'm going to give you the packager's perspective. <laughs> please. No, yeah, please. Uh, um, from a packager's perspective, because we run into a lot of these problems, it really depends on upstream. It also depends on who you're talking about when you talk about saying defaults, because usually there's multiple opinions about what saying defaults are. Um, mm -hmm. There's saying defaults from a distro level. There's saying defaults from a developer's perspective. And a lot of times they clash. So um, it's very difficult. And I also will say that burnout is real, not in that, not in that aspect, but sometimes just trying to deal with a lot of like, I don't know what to call them, just dinosaurs, <laughs> people that resist change, like toxicity sort of behavior. And it just, it gets very tiring. So after a while, like even from a packager's level, you'll stop reporting just from the sheer fact that you don't want to get insulted. Yeah. You know, you're totally right. I mean, the problem we're facing, right, industry-wide is, is a pile of tech debt and it's not magically going to go away just because we're sitting here realizing it now. And, 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 that's, the, and that's the other thing about tech debt is that it, it, it's, very, it's very complicated because like, and for example, let me give you a very good one. On Mac OS, people just expect for things to work. Homebrew, you download things, they just need to work. In Homebrew, polar opposite. Customization is the word. Every single option you can have. You want a clown, you could have a clown. Basically, it's your choice. So it's it's very like it's also difficult because I think audience has a lot to do with it. Sorry for cutting you off. I just want to. No, no, it's. I, I mean, everything you say is true, and. I think that one of the, you know, we're, we're sort of facing like almost an impossible task here, right? We have this, the diversity of the bazaar, you know, the old cathedral versus the bazaar. Well, we have right. an amazing amount of diversity in the bazaar. And we're now facing some hard choices because there are projects that are simply not going to be able to or not willing to make the changes. And so one of the things I care about the most here is, well, let's at least know where we stand. Like one of the things that we were talking about just the other day is being able to programmatically determine when a project has reached end of life. So that consumers of it can actually know that it's reached end of life. At that point, caveat emptor, right? You are consuming stuff. At the end of the day, the final responsibility for risk falls on the consumer, the end consumer producing an application, because that's where everything materializes. And you can, and so I'd much rather know and then be able to make evaluative decisions. And I'd like to be able to model those decisions better with things like VEX statements. I'd like tools that help me do code coverage analysis to understand what the vectors for risk are, right? Where are those concatenated SQL strings coming from, right? There's a huge difference from, you know, there's awful concatenation problems coming from static strings in my code versus end user input. And we all know those SQL, it's always coming from end user input. This is not gonna end well, but you know, um, that, you know, understanding the code paths and giving people the tools that allow them to take the package that are not going to shift, they're not going to move fast enough, but what do I do right now, right? I'm sitting here standing on this shoulders of giants, but the giant giants have been drinking for 10 years and don't want to stop. What do we do? Maybe not drinking. Maybe they're just sick. I don't know. I, I, the metaphor is tough. I don't want to malign any of the individuals who built the things that we're, we're depending upon. That's not the point. It's that it's you know, there is no free way to fix those things. And, you know, to my early point, SOS isn't going to fix them either, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and I do think that, that even within, you know, if you take 50 open source maintainers that have an identical problem and identical challenges in, or identical like ac activity levels, um, they may have 50 different reasons for that activity level. Some of them, it's, you know, this is free work. If corporations are benefiting by this, I want some, I, I want, I want cash out of it until you give me cash. It's not important. Other people, it's like, no, I have a family. I just don't have time for this. It's, it was a college project, whatever reason. Um, other ones, it's I'm drowning in stuff. It, it's life happened, like whatever it is, whatever the reason is. And, and I think we would, um, 
we should be very careful not to paint too broad of a brushstroke um, in that in thinking that if we just did X, we could get a significant portion of those projects to, to do differently. Um, the reality is like this may be a problem that there actually is no solution to. Um, That's me. More people with the free, I mean, I don't know. I have, I have existed in a career where I have, um, Well, one of the one of the things that I have uh, I have struggled with is is uh, staying on top of uh, priorities, um, and I've always kind of begged for forgiveness first instead of asked permission from my employer. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, also is that a warning to Michael and Michael here. Oh, yeah, but, oh. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, and also, like I, I mean, this. How have I gotten where I am currently? Well, I have done a lot of work in open source that has not necessarily completely been com entirely sanctioned by my employer, right? Because I find this to be fascinating. I find this to be passionate or I was distracted and, you know, not passionate about what I was doing at work and got distracted and engaged in open source security research, right? A lot of other people are, you know, my employer's not covering this. I don't have the time for it. You know, I need to, I need to make sure that I'm spending the time on this thing. Um, and, and like, you know, or for security researchers, like I spent a week, this, I spent a week last, what, before the holidays, engaged in, an, in a constant back and forth with the maintainer of Snake YAML, trying to convince him that he should secure Snake YAML by default and stop me. And then I ended up on a call with him in the middle of my vacation to finally come up with a point where we're like, okay, like this is, this is a thing that we can do to make this more secure that doesn't break a bunch of your end users. It's like a lot of dedication to a single library or single project to convince them how to fix the dang thing in a way that, and this is a bit of vulnerability that's been known for six years. This remote code execution vulnerability in the YAML parser has been known for six years, right? Um, and I don't see this as any different in a lot of ways from like existing open source problems, right? Like how do you get more people in the, in the industry to contribute to open source? Well, you got to convince them that they're, they're not going to get fired because they're engaged in open source work, or they can do it in a way that like, you know, their employer's not going to be entirely upset with them. Right. I know exactly. You got, I mean, you, Michael and Michael have managed to figure this out. You know, all of us on this call have managed to figure this out that we can like do open source work and our own jobs and like, you know, make everybody happy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, but it's, it's but hard. It, but, but, but I, th I think the, the important thing, you know, for, for any, I mean, I know you know this, but for everybody else, like the the out the outcome is not that Snake YAML is more secure. The outcome is that all users of Snake YAML are more so. Absolutely, Snake YAML is the no, number one parser in Maven. No, you, number one YAML parser in Maven. So anybody that uses YAML in a Java ecosystem is better protected because you took that call on your vacation. So yeah, I know. My, my, you. My, you know, my fallback solution was going to generate a few thousand pull requests to fix yeah. it in users, right? It's like, okay, well, I'd rather fix it in the source and then everybody's fixed than have it go generate a few thousand pull requests. Like, let's go to as high up the chain as we can and actually make an impact. And if the maintainer's not responding or they're like, you know, the project's dead, you take the next best option, which is bulk pull request generation. But like, we can fix it at the source. Yep. David, and we just have one one minute left on the call. So, yep. hey, yeah, just real quick, you know, totally agree. I do think that sometimes the challenge is we, we say, hey, we want to make a change, but we want to make a change that's grossly incompatible with the way people are using it. Yeah. And I, I think, frankly, a little sympathy to the current end users is really valuable. Um, sometimes I find that the obvious fix, well, hey, we'll just rewrite the whole API and everyone will switch. No, they will not. Or it'll take you 10, uh, 10 15 years of unnecessary pain. Um, I think sometimes when you're at that point, step back, is there a way to do this without causing the pain? Not always, but often you can. And I, I think a little bit of extra looking at that can solve hey, our problems. A plug for the end user working group. Yeah. Um, they are living and walking through those things. We're at time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Be well. <laughs>